today, and it's only 11 o'clock, so it's going to be a quicker service, but that's all right. Do you know why? Because these altars are going to be opened up after this service. The reason I was led to do that is because if you remember in the older days the altars were open the altars were open that we could meet our Lord and Savior in this place of worship the altars were open so that we could meet God in this place in this sanctuary or in the old sanctuary where we could worship God as a gathering together because we draw strength whenever we gather together to worship together. And how many times in your past, in my past, have we broken through, has God broken through to us in our spirit, have filled us with the Holy Spirit, have renewed our, our commitment to Him at an altar of prayer? How many times have we, have we been so fortunate to have an encounter with God that changed our life forever at an altar like this? So today, after this message that I'm going to bring, I will open up these altars. And any of you that want to come and pray you are more than willing to pray for however long you want to pray because I want God's move in this house. My message today is entitled Unending Love and Amazing Grace. And I'm going to read a quote from the book The Power to Change the World, The Welch and Azusa Street Revivals, and it's by Rick Joyner. And he says this, the strength and longevity of anything that is built will be affected by the strength of the foundation is built upon. And who do we build our strength, our lives upon? But upon the rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In Psalm 46, and this is not the text, but this is what the Lord also gave me. In Psalm 46, it says this, God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid. Though the earth trembles and the mountains topple and the depths of the sea Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with its turmoil, there is a river in the streams delight the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. There is a river flowing, and that river is the spirit of the Holy Spirit ordained by God on the day of Pentecost where he filled the 120 with fire and power and authority to stand boldly so that they could proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we need that today, the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our, in our churches and in the altars because we are so close to the coming of Christ. So I want to leave you with a thought today regarding a message of hope, a message of unending love, a message of amazing grace that can only come from Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Our text this morning comes from Psalm chapter 42. Psalm 42, the Holman Christian Standard Bible says this, as a deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I come and appear before you, God? My tears have been my food day and night, while all day long people say to me, where is your God? 
I remember this as I pour out my heart, how I watched with many leading the festival pro procession to the house of God with joyful and thankful shouts. Why am I so depressed? Why this turmoil within me? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. I'm deeply depressed. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and the peaks of Hermon from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your billows have swept over me. The Lord will send his faithful love by day. His song will be with me in the night. A prayer to, God, to the God of my life. I will say to, to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about in sorrow? Because of the enemy's oppression. My adversaries taunt me as if crushing my bones while all day long they say to me, where is your God? Why am I so depressed? Why this turmoil within me? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. Let's pray for this word and for the message that God has given me. Dear Jesus, right now I pray for your anointing upon this word, your word, your living word. I thank you so much for giving me this message. It is not mine, it is yours. I am just your servant. I'm here as a mouthpiece for you, and that is all. I thank you, dear Jesus, for your presence in this place, for your mighty power in this place, and for what is going to transpire in this place. I thank you. You are our Savior and our Lord, our risen Savior and our living Lord. Bless this message, and I thank you, dear Jesus. I'm only your servant. In this I pray in your mighty and glorious name. Amen. See, looking around our nation today, as we have contended with lost jobs, financial difficulties, family life turned upside down, worry, fear, death, and the rise in violence throughout our country, throughout the world, and even through our city, all that you have to do is listen to the news regarding our city and see how violence has increased, during, especially during this past year and a half, that, there is, that some people have concluded that there is not much to hope for, either now or in the future. This lack of hope and heaviness of spirit has even affected Christians with some sliding into depression. This lack of hope can cause us to despair and turn our attention from our source of strength, Jesus Christ, the living Son of God. Listen to what has happened according to numerous reports and sources within our nation as a result of the fallout from this COVID virus. And I quote, as the COVID virus spread throughout the United States, it had a disastrous effect on the mental health of the nation. As opposed to previous disasters in the United States that affected certain specific regions or populations where aid and trauma response could be concentrated, the COVID virus affected the entire population of the country. In other words, different compared to like the Joplin tornado or Katrina or, or, or uh, uh, Hurricane Sandy. While the risk of contracting the disease itself was a population-wide traumatizing effect, our physical and social environment 
have changed as well, leading to greater rates of isolation and loneliness, financial hardship, housing, food insecurity, and violence. Just think about where we was one year ago. Two years ago, prior to the COVID virus, I thank the Lord every single day that this church was opened up on Mother's Day of May 2020, and the doors have not been closed since. See, this morning I would like to show you six things that the writer of this psalm does in his spiritual depression. Six things that I think are meant to shape how we can deal with our seasons of lack of hope and heaviness of heart. Externally, his circumstances are oppressing. Verse 3 says, My tears have been my food day and night, while all day long people say to me, Where is your God? Isn't that sometimes what transpires in our life? Circumstances comes to our lives, and people around us will say, well, where is your God? Why isn't he answering? And in verse 10, it says the same thing, only it describes the effect as a deadly wound. My adversaries taunt me as if crushing my bones while all day long they say to me, where is your God? And uh, the term, where is your God, implies that something else has gone wrong with this writer. How many times, again, have people said, where is your God? Where is your Lord? Why isn't he answering your prayer? See, it implies something else has gone wrong and because they wouldn't be saying, where is your God? It looks to them from the outside. It looks to them as he's been abandoned by God. This reminds me of another passage within Scripture or other passages like Matthew uh, chapter 27, verses 39 through 43. Mark 15, 29 through 32, and Luke 23, 35 through 37, when the people mocked Jesus while he was hanging on the cross, also saying, where is your God? Matthew chapter 27, 39 through 43 says this, and those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests, also mocking with the scribes and elders, said he saved others himself. He cannot save him. Save him. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. In other words, they were mocking Jesus on the cross in saying, Where is your God? This also reminds me of a passage in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, and in the Living Bible regarding others who scoff about the return of Jesus Christ. First, I want to remind you that in the last days, there will come scoffers who will do every wrong they can think of and laugh at the truth. This will be their line of argument. So Jesus promised to come back. So Jesus promised to come back, didn't he? Then where is he? He'll never come. Why, as far back as anyone can remember, everything has remained exactly as it was since the first day of creation. 
How many individuals do you know think that everything will just go on? Jesus is coming back. The tribulation is going to happen. It's in the word of God, and it will happen just as he came the first time. So, too, he will come again. See, it's not so uncommon that when we are at our lowest, those who should be there are not. They're not there for us. We as Christians especially have a duty to help those in need, not only in lifting them up in prayer, but also to be an encouragement to them in whatever capacity we can be. How many times, especially on Facebook or on Messenger or on text or whatever, we'll say, oh, I'll pray for you. And that's all the further it goes. How many times can we do something else? The story is in my mind regarding the Good Samaritan, how the others passed over on the other side. But the Good Samaritan, he didn't just go over and say, well, I'll pray for you, I'll, I'll give a sacrifice for you, whatever. No, he done what he could do, put him up in a room, all that. He helped him tangibly. We are called to help those in need. We are called to help those not only in prayer, but also to do more than that because we are called by God to stand boldly before individuals right now in this time and place and in this time that we are living in to stand boldly and show the light of Jesus Christ to the world. Listen to the internal emotional condition of the psalmist who is depressed and full of turmoil. In verses 5 and 11, he describes himself as, why am I so depressed and why this turmoil within me? In verse 3, he says, my tears have been my food day and night. How many times have we cried and wept day and night over a situation, over a situation we had no control over? How many times have we laid awake at night praying to our Lord and Savior to help in a situation that we have no idea how to handle? This is what that verse is talking about. My tears have been my food day and night. So he is discouraged to the point of crying day and night. And in verse 7, he says that it feels like drowning. All your breakers and your billows have swept over me. Have we all not felt like this at some point in our life where situations have overwhelmed us and we have, even for a fleeting second, had this feeling of lack of hope that can cause us to come to the place where we say, what's the use? But now, listen again to what the writer stated in Psalm 42, 5 and 11. When he asked himself about his depression, and listen carefully to his response. Verse 5, why am I so depressed? Why this turmoil within me? And his response to himself was this. Put your hope or put, I will put my hope in God. For I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. Verse 11 is, is sort of the same thing. Why am I so depressed? Why this turmoil within me? And he does the same refrain. Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. Our Lord and Savior is our hope. Our Lord and Savior is the only one we can trust and place our hope in whenever circumstances overwhelm us. See, even in his depressed state, the writer is fighting for hope. He is not surrendering to the emotions of discouragement, but rather he is fighting back by placing his hope in Almighty God. 
We in this sanctuary and those who are watching by live stream or by mygladtidings.org must grasp that the only true hope we have is in God and in his son, Jesus Christ, the one who is, who was, and who is to come. We must remember that just as a psalmist external circumstances were oppressing and his eternal emotional state and condition is depressed and full of turmoil. He nevertheless is fighting for hope. And the really remarkable thing is that at the end of this psalm, at the end of chapter 42, he is still fighting even though he is still not yet where he wants to be. So just how does the psalmist respond to discouragement, turmoil, mockery, uh, being depressed? Here are six ways that the writer responds to the discouragement and turmoil that has come with the taunts of his enemy and the circumstances surrounding him. He asks God why. That It's like here he is, knowing that God is almighty, and yet he asks why. He responds to his circumstances at one point by asking God why. Now, I know that question can be asked because of the circumstances that have surrounded in my own life. There have been times I have also asked why. Verse 9 says this, I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Now, isn't that strange? The first part of the verse, he says, I will say to God, my rock. He alludes to the fact that God is his rock. And yet in the next breath, he says, why have you forgotten me? To the writer, it feels if God has forgotten him. If God hasn't forgotten him, why aren't these enemies driven back and consumed? Why are, are my prayers, his prayers, not answered yet? Why did my loved one die? It's a legitimate question for the writer to ask, and so it is with us also. He may not have asked the question with theological and linguistic precision, but he comes back to the absolute truth of the Bible that he will put your hope or he'll put his hope in God for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. And that's where we need to place our hope in God, in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Even the psalmist, state of depression, and turmoil. He still comprehends that God's unending love and amazing grace are more than sufficient for him to place his total trust and hope in the living God of the universe. He affirms God's sovereign love. Look at how even in the midst of his discouragement, he affirms God's sovereign love for him. The first part of verse 8 says this, the Lord will send his faithful love by day. In verse 5 and 11, he calls God my Savior and my God. And even though he asks the question of why it looks as if God has forgotten him, he never stops believing in the absolute sovereignty of God. In other words, he never loses his grip on the great truths about God and the hope we can find only in him. He sings. I know I don't sing good. You already heard that today. He sings to the Lord at night. Ver the latter part of verse 8 says this. His song will be with me in the night, a prayer to the God of my life. He doesn't feel jubilant, 
But even in his despair, this is a prayer song to the God of my life. I remember another event in Scripture when even in the midst of the most dire circumstances, the song of praise and prayer changed everything. In Acts chapter 16, verses 25 through 28, it says, But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And if you go reading further on in that passage, you find out that not only the guard, but his family was saved. God changed circumstances through prayer and praise. I cannot stress enough when life leaves you stressed, despondent, and with a feeling of hopelessness, God is with you, and we can still praise him with singing and with praise. And just as with the psalmist and with Paul and Silas, though you may think God has forgotten you, he has not, for his amazing grace and unending love are always in abundance to give us hope and sustain us through any kind of situation. He preaches it to himself. Now, this sounds a little funny. He preaches to himself. But it's like David, whenever he preached to himself and made himself realize and remember God's goodness. The psalmist preaches to his own soul. In verse 5, it says, Why am I so depressed? Why this turmoil within me? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. How crucial this is in the fight of faith. We must learn to preach the truth to ourselves in building up our faith in Christ. Throughout the Bible, Jesus proclaims that if you can just have faith in him, he is enough to walk with you, beside you, through any difficulty you may encounter giving you absolute hope. He is our resurrection and our hope. He remembers past experiences. As we have dealt with previous lessons in our, in our adult Sunday school class, he re, it is good for us to remember it's good for us to think back to when God answered prayers for us, whenever he touched our lives, whenever he gave us that special anointing we needed, whenever he endued us with power for a certain situation. It is good for us to remember. It's also good for us to remember of the times whenever we was at these altars and God met us here. See, the psalmist remembers, he recalls past experiences to mind. In verse 4, it says, I remember this as I pour out my heart, how I walked with many, leading the festive procession to the house of God with joyful and thankful shouts. In other words, he was coming to the house of God just as we need to come to the house of God. Oh, so much could be said here about the importance of corporate worship in our lives, about not forsaking the gathering together as the time draws close to the, to the coming of our Lord and Savior. Don't take these times lightly. There are appointed times 
in this place, at these altars, where God can meet us and challenge us and give us strength. Together, a real transaction with the living God can not only happen in our individual lives, but in our corporate worship together. God means for these encounters with him in corporate worship to preserve our faith now and in a way that we can remember later. If corporate worship were not a supernatural work of God, it would be pure sentimentalism for the psalmist and for us only to remember our experiences. But it is more than that. It's more than just nostalgia. He is confirming his faith in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of discouragement, by remembering how real God was in corporate worship. Oh, how much more serious we should be about corporate worship in these last days. He thirsts for God. Finally, the psalmist thirsts for God, like a deer pants for the stream. In verses 1 and 2, it says this, As the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I come and appear before God? And the thing that is great about that, we can come before our Lord and Savior to the throne of God anytime we please. What makes this so beautiful and so crucial for us is that he is not thirsting mainly for relief from his threatening circumstances. He is not thirsting mainly for escape from his enemies or for their destruction. It's not wrong to want relief or to pray for it. But more important than anything else, he is thirsting after God himself and his presence. When we come to love God with all our being, with all our heart, mind, and soul, when we crave to be in his presence, although we may be discouraged, depressed, in turmoil, even to our weakest point, Whenever we might say for a fleeting second, what's the use? That is when our Lord and Savior lifts us up in his presence and displays to us his unending love and amazing grace. Please, please remember the words of Romans chapter 8, 37 through 39. Know in all these things we have complete victory, through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor heavenly rulers, nor things that are present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us, be able to separate you and I from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So in concluding this message of hope today, because of God's unending love and amazing grace, let us always remember that as we thirst after God, no matter how dark the night or how fierce the trail or how broken we are, God will never leave us or forsake us. For those sitting in this sanctuary, for those who are watching live stream or on the YouTube, I want to tell you, God will never leave us or forsake us. I don't know who this message is going to, but it's going to somebody or some individuals who need to be encouraged, who are despondent, who are at the end of their rope, who have said, what's the use? But God is there for you. He will help you. See, God is never going to leave us or forsake us. You see, it is like the story told by Mrs. Gibbons, a kindergarten teacher. And this is her story, and I'll read it like how she wrote it. She had a student with a physical need that required more practice in coloring and writing than what she was providing. 
the occupational therapist came in and looked over the workspace to help me and give me pointers on supporting the student with writing, coloring, and other fine motor skills. And guess what she did first? She took brand new crayons and broke them. She broke crayons just like this as she was talking. She took the brand new crayons and broke them one by one as she was just talking to me. She stood there breaking away. Finally, I yelped, what are you doing? And our awesome therapist said words that have stuck with me as she kept on breaking the crayons. Paige, broken crayons make weak hands strong. Kids who can't hold a pencil can grip a broken crayon. They have to bear down and hold it tightly with their correct finger positioning when their crayon is broken. Please, oh please listen to me, to what God is saying to you and to me. You are not forgotten by God. Even when you have been broken, there is still and a lack of hope. You have a lack of hope and a heaviness of spirit that has affected you, even with some who have become depressed. For just as the psalmist who said, why am I so depressed? Why this turmoil within me? God, through his son, Jesus Christ, declares to you and to me that there is no one no one on earth who understands you as I do. That's what Jesus has done for us. He understands us at our lowest times. Even if we are depressed, he fully understands us. Take hold of the one who says, of uh, the one who says that even when accusation comes or bad news has been given or disappointments, even death has entered your family, that there is a hiding place you can find in me. The shadow you see over you is the shadow of my rings, wings. It is not a shadow of confusion or despair, but a shadow of my hiding place where I will place you next to my heart. That's what Jesus wants. He wants to shadow us with his wings. For I will take you through the turmoil, no matter how dark the night, nor fierce the battle. Just rest with me in my presence because of my unending love and amazing grace for you. Jesus wants us to bathe and to encompass his love. He wants to strengthen us in our circumstances. No matter what has transpired in our life, he is more than willing to be a guiding light to help us through any circumstances we have. These altars are open for anybody who wants to come, anybody who wants to pray, these altars are open. We know what has transpired in the past, how that the altars and how the heavens have, have opened up whenever people have came to an altar. Jesus is here in this building to meet your need. For those who want to come, you can come, and then we will pray a closing prayer after a